Good evening and welcome. Tonight, we will be going over the history and geography of Al Hasaka in Syria. You can see that this region takes up this horned area of the country. And it has a very interesting landscape. It does have some Syrian desert elements. It does have some rocky Turkish mountainside. And it does have some lush Iraqi um, agricultural farming land. It kind of has a mix of everything of its, of its surrounding area can see the capital city of Al Hasaka right here. It is along the Kabur River, which flows down from Turkey. It's a tributary of the Euphrates River. You can also see the Chog Chog flowing off of it, which is a really fun name. And um, I will show you the landscape when we get to the Google Earth portion, but it's, it's very beautiful and has this kind of um, feeling that I can't quite describe, but it's what I get when I am looking at ancient sites of like Turkey, Mesopotamia. That feeling that people have been here for as long as people have been, and you just get this very old, very respectful feeling. From the landscape and that's definitely because this area is absolutely dotted with archaeological sites from the Mesopotamian era. I'll show you on Google Earth. You can just find any spot here and you'll find some kind of dig site or archaeological site all over the place. So let's get into history because we are just in the outer corners of the Mesopotamian area between the two rivers, because there's one river, you know, over here, the other's over here. So we are in Mesopotamia. And there are some pretty cool areas. They're known as tells, which is basically like hilly areas that once you start digging, you uncover old buildings and artifacts. There's one right in the middle of the city here, but like I said, they're all over the place. There's one really cool place. You can see Tel Brak right here. It has a really interesting history. There was a civilization here that collapsed that the ancient Mesopotamian civilization knew about and tried to record as best they could in their cuneiform. I think that is fascinating. There was a temple there in the first civilization where some artifacts have been found that are known as eye statues, and they call it the Eye Temple. Um, oh, I should have pulled up some pictures. <laughs> um, I'll try to throw one up on screen if I remember, but they're very haunting, you know, artifacts from that time. There's a kind of eeriness to them our very, 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 very ancient ancestors trying to leave their mark on history with the only methods that they could. And it's a little spooky, to be honest. They're kind of scary looking, but really cool nonetheless. Um, eventually it turned into the city of Nagar, and all the other tales here also became little cities in their own right. They were eventually ta attacked by the people of Mari and also um, Sargon of Akkad, making it part of the Akkadian Empire, later by Ashurbanipal of, I think he officially was ruler of Babylon because he would conquer Akkad. This area was just kind of walked all over from the great powers of ancient Mesopotamia. Eventually, Alexander the Great would take all of that over, a Hellenistic period of Greek-influenced architecture and culture would take over, which would lead to a Roman one. 
um, there's evidence, I'm trying to glance at my notes because there's a lot in this era, um, evidence that they spoke Aramaean in this region. But by the time that Islam would have taken over, particularly in the Abbasid era, the Abbasid era, um, the area was just kind of neglected and forgotten about. There isn't really much here to write home about, especially when the Abbasid Caliphate encompassed so much of like the Middle East and Africa all over this region that this area wasn't particularly special so it was just kind of forgotten about and even once the Ottomans officially took over the area they didn't really do much with it either it wasn't until the French mandate period that things started to happen in this region so after World War I the Ottoman Empire collapsed and uh, Britain and France divvied up the territory amongst themselves, so I think pretty much all of Syria fell under French control, and they would establish the city of al Husaka in 1922. Now, a couple of things would happen in the early 20th century that would change the cultural landscape of this region forever. One was the Armenian Genocide up in Turkey, because the border is right here. So many, many Armenians were fleeing over the border and coming to this, you know, quiet area of Syria where they wouldn't be bothered and of course bringing their religion and culture along with them. The Kurds in Iraq were fleeing persecution as well coming into the area where it was nice and quiet, bringing with them their religion and culture. And there were also many other kind of minor ethnic groups like Assyrians, Chaldeans, and of course Arabs were living here as well, but it was a very eclectic mix. It still is today, but it was very, very diverse in the 1920s, 1930s. And that wasn't always a good thing. There was a lot of clashing between these very different ethnicities and their very different cultures and various religions. And still kind of is today. Not as badly as it was back then, and we'll talk about why that is in a minute. But, um, yeah, people did not really get along with their other neighbors. This area today is considered part of Kurdistan. Um, did I write down? Yeah, Rojava is what they refer to this region as. The Kurds, if you don't know, and correct me if I'm wrong, I read this somewhere, but I didn't verify it, and I read it a long time ago, that the Kurdish people are the world's largest ethnicity without a, a homeland, without their own territory say that this is where we're from. So their their area spreads between Syria, Iraq, I think still parts of Turkey, and um, there was an independence movement for this region for the Kurds in the mid-20th century. Um, some people supported it, some people, mostly Arabs, did not. And, you know, the reasoning behind separating from Syria is that Syria is a majority Arab country and this region is not as majority Arab ethnicity, right? Um, it never really turned into a lot of violence, but there were definitely lots of clashes and protests. That would change in about the 1950s, 1960s, when as you can see here, oil was discovered in the region. You can see some up here as well. And, you know, Syria, the government went from like, oh, who cares, it's just the backwaters, let them do whatever, to like, oh, well then, <laughs> this is a very interesting development. Um, we really like this area up here and we would like to do more with it. 
So the region, particularly the capital city here, absolutely boomed in terms of infrastructure, um, building like dams, new roads, lots of buildings, um, really improving the agriculture of the region as well. It turned into a breadbasket region where all this land where there is not much happening was very fertile, as like the ancient Mesopotamians knew. So they started building all kinds of farms, in particular cotton is mostly grown here. And the region started to do pretty well for itself. Granted, there was still some ethnic tension, mainly between the Kurds and Arabs, but also the Assyrians and Chaldeans, you know, they are like all, all the ethnic groups were just kind of like, you know, agreeing to disagree very strongly, you know, a lot was happening here. That would all change in 2011, because as you know, that is the time of the Arab Spring. I didn't write down the word and I can't think of it, but it's like the nice way of setting yourself on fire in protest. I can't remember the word. That happened over in Tunisia, which sparked the Arab Spring, someone protesting their government. And a Kurdish person did that in Hasaka, and it sparked the Arab Spring protests in Syria. It all started here, which some countries during the Arab Spring protests had a lot of success in getting rid of the corruption in their government and getting what the protesters wanted. Some countries were just like, okay, okay, we'll make changes, and then they didn't. And some countries reacted very, very violently to these protesters, and Syria was sadly one of these countries. It would spark the Syrian civil war. The government responded very negatively to the protests about their you know, I hesitate to say corrupt government, but it was, you know, when you have a president that rules for forever and when they die, it goes to their son, that's, that's not what a president, that's not the definition of a president, right? Um, and then when that president refuses to make any changes to better their country and not listen to the demands of protesters, not even entertaining the idea, just trying to end it as violently as possible. That's not what a president does, so, you know, you could say it's a corrupt government, I suppose. Um, the, the government and the protesters, which would turn into rebels, would start fighting back, and this led to, um, <laughs> trying to be relaxing about the Syrian civil um, Islamist militant groups moving in and taking advantage of the instability. Um, like I said in another video, I think it was about Iraq, um, they were primarily known as ISIS. I think they're gonna go down in history as IS for Islamic State. Um, they were very, very active in the area here, coming in and invading and taking over. Again, it was a very unstable time. Not only do you have civil war in Syria, but you have all of this tension here. And IS, being Islamist, were anti anything other than their extremist Islamist beliefs and were willing to remove from this planet any people who did not have their extreme Islamist beliefs, which is an issue in a region like this that is so ethnically diverse, right? It's very, very dangerous. So it turned into a war on three fronts, right? Culminating in here. There was a massive battle. This uh, They moved in in 2015. There was a huge battle um, I think that went from 2015 to 2016 in the city here, with the government fighting back against IS. Um, Kurdish militant groups also sprung up to fight back against IS and the Syrian government. The Syrian government established its own police force for the region here, which were particularly brutal, so the big battle you know, involved IS, but was also the Kurdish fighters fighting 
this militant police force. It was a mess. It quite devastated the area, and as you can imagine, people fleeing their homes and escaping all of this violence was very tough, but thankfully, I think both sides came to the realization, particularly the militant police force, that IS is the main problem, and that needs to be addressed before anything else. So they, in particular, cracked down super hard against IS, built a huge prison complex in the city here to house their um, IS prisoners, and managed to calm down the area by 2021. I think IS, you know, was done by like 2018, 2019, but the, the fighting didn't really start to calm down until 2021. But that does not mean since, you know, IS is kind of done at this point, there are still sleeper cells and sympathizers in the region and in the city. And in 2022, they organized a massive surprise attack against this prison, trying to get all of the prisoners out. And it was a very long, rough battle, but this militant Syrian police force was victorious at the end of the day. I think it lasted for like three days. Very, very violent attack. Um, I was watching news reports about people who are just living their everyday lives here being like, you know, it's any moment they're going to pop back up and attack and we don't know who they are, where they're coming from. We just know that they're here and we know it could happen at any time and we're afraid to send our children to school, things like that. It must be very, very, very stressful to know that any moment terrorists could spring a surprise attack. But um, it has not happened for over a year at this point. You know, I want to be hopeful, but you just never know. The area is still very unstable. The Syrian civil war is technically still going on, although much of the principal fighting has ceased, thankfully. And that is where we are in the history of this region, a very turbulent one in the past 10, 12 years or so. Probably its most turbulent time since it kept getting invaded by Syria back in the ancient Mesopotamian times. And speaking of those times, let's check out Google Earth so I can show you some of these amazing archaeological sites. So here I have outlined for you in red the governorate. You can see it here on the grand scale of things. You can see the big mighty Euphrates River and the tributaries that flow into al -Hasaka. And then, let me zoom out so you can see exactly where we are in the world. If you have no idea where Syria is located, we are right smack dab in the Middle East, aren't we? You can see Anatolia, part of Turkey up here, the Arabian Peninsula, you can see Egypt, the Caspian Sea, and Central Asia, and then of course there's the Black Sea and Europe. That is where we are in the world. So let's start off by checking out the main city of uh, Hosaka. I tried looking around to see if there's anything interesting to show you guys. Um, but you can look at the slideshow. We can see here a gorgeous church, right? Um, since the, the many ethnic groups are varying religions, mostly different sects of Christianity, there are lots of really gorgeous churches in the region here very busy, bustling city, some growth there. I love this gate. It looks like this is from the era when Egypt and Syria tried to make themselves one country, because this looks like both of their flags. Um, it only lasted about two years, but um, that looks like a relic from that time. It was in, what, the 70s, 80s? And it looks kind of Soviet brutalist, right? Interesting gate there. There's another beautiful church, beautiful dome right there. The lush green land, the beautiful landscape. There's the city from a distance. Little roundabout art areas, lush farmland, old statues, sheepies. 
I like this. I like how this eagle or hawk of some kind is coming out of just what looks like rubble. I think that's a good metaphor, isn't it? And yeah, look at the peacock. Pretty. And more sheepies. It's a busy, bustling city, isn't it? So let's take a look at the landscape here. You can really tell, like, you can just kind of zoom in on a random area and see all of the farms in the area. Like, even in places where it looks like there's really nothing, you can tell that the land is still maintained to some aspect, right? Like, maybe this wasn't the season. Here is Tel Brock, which here is the Tel, right? Isn't that something? Let me see if it's in 3D. It certainly is a little bit. You can see the tell right there that the town is named after. Let's look at a slideshow to see if we can see the old relics in this slideshow. This looks like some beautiful flowers. It's not really what I want to see. I really want to see the site here. Bummer. You can see some of it from above, how they're working on uncovering this ancient city. Pretty neat. But let's find another one. They're all over the place. Let's find a random spot. Of course, now when that I say that, I'm not going to find one. Watch. <laughs> watch, watch, watch. Surely I'm going to find one. There's Tel Bedar. Nope, nothing there. Yeah, when I say that, I'm not going to find something. And look at the border with Turkey. What a difference can definitely tell which side has been dealing with the civil war for the past decade and which side has not, right? Let's find some ancient relics. Tell me how when I was playing with this I found like five just randomly, but now when I'm doing it on camera, I'm not going to be able to find one. You know where I found a cool one? It was in these mountains here. I was like, oh man, there's got to be something here. And yes, look at this. Up there on that hill. Come on. Old towers of things. Look at that. What a beautiful landscape. It's gorgeous, right? Like there are sights all over the place. See if this has anything. No, darn. <laughs> I promise you that there's sites all over the place. Let's see what that is. Anything? Nope. Darn. I knew this was going to happen. I should have pinned some spots for you guys. Because I was just going all over the place and finding all kinds of random stuff. And now I was like, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this now, but when I do it on camera, I'm not going to find anything. And sure enough. Sure enough. Look at all this land here. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> I, I built this up to show you guys some cool archaeological sites. Let's see here. Let's see, let's see. Oop, that's still and I could have sworn that I had some good pictures here. I don't know. But we're in the right region, aren't we? Let's see. Alright, so as I was trying to find places, my phone that I'm recording on overheated and stopped recording. So I'm going to take that as my sign to just throw in the towel and give up. I found other sites, but you can't really tell what they are from above. So, um, of course, now that, you know, I am recording, I can't find anything. <laughs> but I definitely encourage you to play around this area and find some cool stuff to see because it's definitely there, I assure you. So, I'm going to cut off the video here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this type of content, please consider subscribing. This is an ongoing series on my channel where we go to every little corner of the world. Next, we'll be hopping down to Yemen. 
so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out. I hope that you found this video relaxing and educational. I really hope you found it relaxing. And I hope that you have a very good, 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 good 